If you volunteered, uh, you could choose which branch of the service you would go into. And uh, because when I got my draft notice, I noticed I was 1A, and I understood that. And uh, you had your choice of Navy, Army, Marine Corps, or Air Force. And uh, I chose the Air Force. You know, I'd never been sorry. I had a lot of good times in the Air Force, and some could be could have improved on. I'll tell you. But uh, by and large, uh, I've always remembered my days in the service with great fondness. Well, actually, I was drafted. I was late reporting to the draft board because I, I was against the war, and I went drinking, and uh, the MPs came to my house, and my mother told them where I was. God bless them. The response, I think, to the draft was entirely different. Very quickly, that became controversial. Uh, you get the feeling that in World War I, young men were... Uh, rushing to be to, to to be conscripted to be enlisted in the military is by the time that the Vietnam War was fully up and operating uh, that that was controversial. The uh, demonstrations on a regular basis in the Central Business District and protests and things of that sort and that may be something that is kind of the face of wars since Vietnam as well. I have two daughters. They were they were not very impressed teenagers they're not real happy with that because it was looking like I'm going away and nobody at that time knew what a war in Iraq, in Iraq was going to be like you know they're talking about chemical attacks and how bad it can be and all that so they're pretty apprehensive but uh, I think proud of me also they, they acted like it anyway you know when you first go over there you're young, you're full of everything, and I'm going to go over here and end this thing, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And then you, then you get scared. And anybody says they're over there flying or on the ground, said they wasn't scared. I, I'd question that. Shells that will reach up to 25,000 feet, and when it blows, uh, with a proximity fuse in it, it'll blow and then just chunks of iron, scrap iron, shrapnel flies all over the place in a big pattern. And uh, that will usually knock a plane down if it gets close to you. And uh, that's we got ours. And uh, then we had engine trouble and couldn't keep up with the formation. And when we, we knew that was a kiss of death when you can't, uh, you don't have anybody to protect you from the other planes. And we started on down a burst of flak growth in the waist. And that B-17 just, you could feel it buckle. And then it started with this. And when, when that happens, you start whirling around like this. And you don't, the thing you want to do is grab a hold, try to get a hold of something to hang on and uh, there's no need to try to walk or go any place because you aren't going to make it. And we, went, we were coming down from around 25,500 feet in altitude. And by the time we got down to, I don't, I, I'm just guessing, but I think it was in that neighborhood, about 5,000 to 3,000 feet, we were able to pull that plane out. and. Uh, then we knew we were either going to have to bail out or crash, one or the other. And we saw this field, and uh, it looked like a hay field. It's got grass in it, anyhow. And yet, then you make a quick judgment on, is that long enough for this plane to end? What's on the other side of it, you know? Got to try it. So uh, our pilot and co-pilot, they let the plane down, and. Lo and behold, this little marshy area. And then when I left, I was also in charge of the weapons. I had all my bags I had to do. It was pretty intense. And then when I got over to Iraq, it was just like, oh my gosh, where am I? It was just this experience I had never imagined. Everything was so, nothing. it was all desert, because I was in Nazaria. And that's um, about 150 miles from Baghdad. And when you get over there, it's just, the base was just stretched for miles. I mean, it just miles and miles and miles, nothing but barbed wiring. 
that ran just everywhere around. All you see is barbed wiring on the fences. A typical day was, uh, you know what MREs are, but, yeah. Eating one of those for breakfast, uh, sleeping on the helicopter or wherever you could find a place to sleep. Some people slept in uh, shipping containers. We found, we went into this Iraqi Air Force base, it had been a fighter base of theirs, and in a junkyard found these little shipping containers from their Russian cargo planes that they had. And we made little houses out of those, like little garden tool shed, and lived in those, you know, so, and, you know, bottles of hot water, we had no electricity, refrigeration, anything like that. So a typical day then was just eating and drinking your hot water and maybe flying missions if we were flying that day, door gunning or doing helicopter maintenance. We had a lot of guys that, that took their own lives, you know, because they, they had enough, number one, or things weren't good at home. You know, Dear Johns, whew, Dear Johns were everywhere. I got a Dear John, Thanksgiving Day in Vietnam, so it was, uh, it was tough on you. You know, you were, you were under a lot of pressure to perform, to do your job, to you know, stay on an even keel. Well, you know, it's tough being on an even keel when someone's shooting at you. We'd have four, you'd have cots in the ER and you'd have four victims come in and they'd all be like, let's say, have, be near death. You would have to move to each one and there would be just, I don't mean there'd be blood, I mean everything would be everywhere. I'll never forget. I mean, you'd just be, you'd be moving non-stop. I mean, until it was done. It, seem, it seems there is, there is a perceptible pattern. It seems that what people really remember, what veterans really remember, what veterans uh, value and retain has much more to do with the personal relationships, individual acts of courage, uh, uh, the sort of strength that they see in the bond that's created by, by men who are under fire, share a common cause. The most impressive to me was the camaraderie of living together, being together, helping each other, knowing each other's responsibilities. If one got hurt for one reason or another, whatever it may be, that we could fill in accordingly. Uh, it was a real team effort, like a baseball football team or something like that, you know, basically speaking. So uh, uh, this really, I think, as a young man at my age, as young as I was, taught me how necessary, useful it is to be close to each other, you know, as close as you can get anyway. The military is a great place to get an education. It's not all war, guns and bat. It's an education. You can learn a tremendous amount. You have, you can go into the military and learn how to be uh, a doctor. You can learn how to be, it can help you get get through it can teach you a skill that you can take with you uh, through life that's a that's a positive thing when you get on that helicopter for that last flight out you're praying no missiles please don't shoot this one down let me get out of here but in the meantime you're feeling sad because you're leaving so many people behind you I was glad to get back to this country I always told myself when I got back to this country at one time, I didn't think I'd ever get back. And then it came towards the end that I figured I was going to get back. And boy, I almost kissed the ground and wherever I got discharged. I think it was San Francisco. But They also in, in set up big circus-sized tents. And I remember it was marked kind of A, B, C, D. And they said, if you've been a prisoner of war up to six months, you go in A. You go, if you're six months to a year in B, a year to a year and a half in C, and over a year and a half you go to D. Words of that effect, anyhow. That uh, so I went into D, and that was, it was full. And they talked about being sent home by a, a liner or a boat or a ship. Uh, not many of you will be flown home. We still need the airplanes in Europe, etc. And, uh, and that, near the end of it, they hold, hold a lot of things, but near the end of it, the, the, the guy was a doctor, I'd say he's a judge in being mid-40. He went through a lot of things, and we've checked your blood pressure and all your throats and what have you. 
And he says, words to this effect anyway, is, you're all probably wondering how your year and a half or better in the prison camp is going to affect your longevity. And I thought at the time, I sure as hell wasn't thinking about it, you know. <laughs> and so that's why I give you some, just some information, how accurate it is, I don't know, but uh, I know there were guys like me who had one, from, after he said what he said, he's, and this is what he said. He said, you take the age at which your parents died, average them out, and that's about when you're going to go. And you want to know what kind of demographics he used to come up with that. And uh, we, we know what he did. But I kind of kept track of the ten guys in our corner. And uh, only one outlived his prediction, Red Ellis. He was down in Florida, and uh, he died two years ago. Oh, that was great. Oh, it's fantastic. It's like almost like you're a celebrity or something. You know, it's embarrassing kind of how people were. Um, I would say like the total opposite of what I hear about how it was people coming home from Vietnam. I processed out at Fort Ord, California, walked out to the front of Fort Ord, hailed a cab. Cab pulls over, I throw my bags in, I jump in the car, I say, wow, I'm back in the world. Back from Vietnam, the cab driver could have cared less. He ripped me. He ripped me for doing what I did over there. And I'm sitting in this guy's cab, <laughs> stunned, just stunned. This guy's ripping me. I think people are a lot more patriotic now. Um, you know how the 60s was. Um, I guess that's it, patriotism. Um, maybe people have given more thought to you can say whatever you want about the administration or policies or whatever, but not the individual Joe Schmo going over there doing it. You know, I, I can't believe that they did that back then, that they would think that that was okay. You know? The crime rate, I don't know if people know this, but the crime rate among Vietnam veterans, it shot up when they first came home. It just went through the roof. Guys were out of control. They were still thinking they were in the Delta you know, in a village in Vietnam. Some guys even, I know a lot of guys who walked around in their uniforms for months and months on the time after they, re they came back, and they would only speak like they were in talking to a soldier in a combat situation. And, uh, you know, it just, uh, people say, well, this, that guy's crazy. He lost his mind. He needs help. He's not crazy. He just needs help. When I got home, it was, you, I had to learn to get back into civilian life, or you know, in, into the military life, but in the United States. It was, it was challenging at times because my family, like my husband for instance, I could tell we wanted everything to be back to normal, but I was still a little shocked. And, and so it was kind of weird at times because I wanted to get back into a normal routine, but I knew things had been different. Like I really appreciated water and toilet paper and the food of America. I was just like, oh my gosh. And what we're seeing now is a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a different war than folks have been trained to fight, much different than we've seen since Vietnam, actually, and we're seeing a huge increase in that. Um, so we really need to pay attention to make sure those veterans are getting the counseling that they need to help understand what they've gone through and, and deal with it so they can get on with their lives as a civilian again. We're also seeing big issues around um, physical disabilities. Um, a number of years ago with Vietnam, they were experiencing a lot of similar different ways of, of fighting than we'd been trained to fight. And, but they were also sustaining injuries that, that were not survivable. Medic, um, the medical profession has improved so much that we are seeing folks come back with physical disabilities and emotional disabilities that we haven't seen before. And so that adds an extra burden to dealing with their family life. Um, so marriage counseling, family counseling is very, very important. And then employment. If they're gone for more than a year, businesses typically don't hold their jobs open. So it's important that we can get them back working with a job so they feel like they're contributing again and, and helping support their family. That's really important. And then 
everything that goes along with that transportation and uh, childcare, whatever they need. Support the military. You know, when, when guys come back from combat situations, they need a lot of help. They need to know that you care about them, number one. You know, some people, I've heard people say, well, congrats, thank you for giving us 20 years of your life. Thank you for, you know, protecting us. That makes you feel good. I'd like to read an anonymous um, statement that someone wrote and that how, that's how we feel about our veterans, and I'd like everybody to feel. So, take the time to honor our veterans and the years they served, the guidance, the leadership, the friendship, and the expertise that these veterans have freely given of themselves. Veterans have stood the watch while we lay in our beds at night. They've stood the watch while some of us were still in high school, and they've stood the watch before many of us were even born. They stood the watch in years when the storm clouds of war were brewing on the horizon of history. They have stood the watch over their families, offering guidance and help and a hand to hold during hard times. But still they stood the watch. And why? So that we, our families, and our fellow Americans could sleep soundly in safety, knowing that a veteran stood the watch. We don't make policies. Um, people that fight wars don't start wars. People that fight wars hate wars more than anyone. Um, we're doing something because we think it has a valid reason to be done. Or even if not that, because we signed on the dotted line and we volunteered and that's who's in charge of us says to needs to be done.